Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, bienvenue l'Ambassade de Canada. Welcome to the Canadian Embassy. Uh, Representative Terry, uh, Representative Whitfield, uh, and Senator Richard Newfield, uh, welcome. And uh, representatives of Penmar, uh, the North-South uh, Western Alliance we have together. Uh, it's great to see you here th this morning. I apologize for uh, all of you having to step over all those people working out this morning. Uh, I wasn't there. I wasn't in my spandex. Uh, they didn't issue that for the uh, for the ambassador. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. But uh, but I uh, touch football with the military is uh, Friday morning at seven in the morning. If any of you want to join in, uh, it's pretty full contact as I understand it, and uh, uh, you can you can join in on Friday mornings if you uh, so wish. Uh, I, uh, I I say that because my first. Uh, college football game I ever went to was to watch the Cornhuskers play in Lincoln, Nebraska. There was more people at the football game than lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. So, uh, Representative Terry, I, I know your state well, uh, and I think it's been sold out since, uh, for the last 40 years, it has been a game that hasn't been sold out in that great state uh, of uh, Nebraska. Uh, I, uh, it's interesting, last week, there was a lot of media about all kinds of events down the hill dealing with your occupation uh, in politics uh, uh, just a few blocks away. But also just another few blocks away here in Washington, we had a, uh, a 40th anniversary discussion of the lessons to be learned from the establishment of OPEC. It didn't get as much attention as somebody getting chained to a White House fence uh, and in a, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a protest. But it is important to note that speaker after speaker after speaker were, came forward with a vision uh, that United States, Canada, and Mexico finally, after talking about it for 40 years, have it within our grasp to have energy independence here in North America. Uh, Jeff Immelt. Uh, from Canadian or er, from General Electric, a very very innovative company, a very very uh, friendly company to the environment and to innovation, uh, basically said that the the old debates are just silly <clears throat> in terms of environmentalists versus corporations. It we have to move forward with a vision of energy independence here in North America, and we have the means to do it if we just have a can-do attitude in all three countries to get it done. Our view is uh, that the advice we got two weeks ago from the CEOs from 170 major corporations uh, here in the United States, including companies like Honeywell and Boeing, General Electric, uh, also is wise in terms of an energy independent strategy in this, <clears throat> in this neighborhood. Canada's view on, on energy is uh, having a four-fold vision Number one, uh, energy efficiency. Number two, renewables. Number three, developing gas. <coughs> Excuse me. And number four, developing oil in Canada, United States, and Mexico. When we look at energy efficiency, the best example of how that has been effective to reduce per capita demand for oil uh, and gasoline in our cars is the energy efficiency standards that Canada and the United States agreed to on the same day, the same hour, and the same minute uh, between our two countries uh, to have higher fuel standards uh, in, a uh, in a progression of standards that would be elevated uh, to reduce uh, the fuel consumption in, in the vehicles that are uh, manufactured here in North America. The added benefit of that, of course, is we're selling more cars. And at a time when we were bailing out Detroit and Windsor, not bailing them out, but providing a bridge. That's a more politically correct term to use. <laughs> providing a bridge, and some of that bridge has now been paid back. Um, we, uh, we find that this is also good for the economy and good for cleaner air and cleaner water. So energy efficiency has to be number one for all of us on energy security strategies. Number two is renewables. Uh, if you look of a at a map of Canada and the United States, Besides seeing 75 pipelines going between our two countries in oil and gas, and another 10 pipelines in other areas, 
didn't think I'd have this much controversy going from 75 to 76 pipelines, but I digress. Uh, the, uh, you'll find that there's transmission lines, three major transmission lines, one from the west coast, one from the center, and one from uh, Quebec, and there's another one proposed uh, even east of that in Newfoundland and Labrador down through Atlantic Canada. Uh, you'll find that uh, we in Canada believe very much that hydropower along with wind and solar and geothermal is part of a portfolio of renewables. And sometimes we see controversy on pipelines lately in Canada and the United States, but we're seeing the same kind of opposition to developing renewables in a way of, of, of developing transmission lines. I remember a few years ago working on climate change with what some of the western uh, U.S. states and they got rid of, they were proposing to get rid of a coal plant in San Diego and, pro and replacing it with uh, solar from the desert. That was the good news for the people of San Diego, they thought, except people opposed then the transmission line. Uh, we have opposition to our transmission line from wind from Montana to Lethbridge, Alberta. We have opposition to transmission lines on uh, the East Coast. Uh, I used to say in Canada when I was Premier of Manitoba that there was one lawyer per megawatt to get a transmission line approved. And I think that that is very similar here to the United States. So when the you know, President of the United States and the President of Mexico and the Prime Minister of Canada meet on renewable energy, including hydro, we've just got to get the ability to get a combination of energy, uh, traditional and renewable, onto a transmission line uh, to get it to market. You can't just talk about it, you've got to have the ability to deliver it. And that's also a priority for energy security, we believe, between our countries. Uh, certainly gas and oil, uh, we look forward to the debate going on in Mexico, particularly with the uh, proposals to amend the Constitution uh, to deal with Pemex. Uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, Mexico will be a net importer of oil by the year 2020. So that debate is very, very important in our neighborhood of how that will go. Uh, we respect the sovereign right of the Mexican uh, elected representatives to make that decision, uh, but it represents a, a very, very useful uh, opportunity for energy independence in North, uh, North America. We think that uh, gas, uh, the development of gas is going to have more return of manufacturing decisions that were made 20 years ago the combination of uh, intellectual property issues and the issue of reliable, affordable energy, uh, we think uh, returning to uh, to United States, uh, we think will be very, very important also for our joint manufacturing sector. Uh, when you look at it, about eight years ago, we allegedly had a 10-year supply of natural gas. Uh, two years ago, we allegedly had a 100-year supply and I hate, I hear the latest research indicates a 300 year supply. So uh, this is a lot of, that's a lot of supply. That will outlast all of us uh, in terms of supply of gas here in, in, again, in North America. And finally, oil. Uh, the development of domestic oil in the US, uh, the development of uh, domestic oil in Canada. Uh, the Bakken oil fields, by the way, have straddled the border. Uh, with horizontal drilling, you've got to really be careful. Under you know, I know Manitoba's on the border of, uh, of North Dakota. You know, they uh, uh, John Hoven and I used to have some fun about horizontal drilling. Who's drilling which way underneath that border? Uh, but uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Montana, and North Dakota have the Bakken oil, and, and it make it's again right right across uh, it's shared right across our border. That is part of the Keystone Pipeline, by the way. A lot of Americans don't know, and part of the media debate isn't the fact that the pipeline includes, uh, includes oil from uh, uh, middle America uh, as well as uh, from, uh, from Alberta. Uh, on that proposed pipeline, we see uh, the uh, State Department's logic in uh, approving this pipeline as being a part of this North Ameri American energy independence strategy. Uh, they said if the Keystone Pipeline is approved, the United States will be able to displace Venezuela uh, as a source of crude oil and it will be less reliant on the Middle East. 
looking at the Middle East, we're together, we've been together, Canada, United States, and Libya, Afghanistan, uh, we have sanctions with you on Syria, we have sanctions with you on uh, you being the Americans in Iran. Uh, we are allies in the Middle East, but everybody that turns on their television set every day sees another crisis in the Middle East. You don't see that, uh, or as the governor of Nor uh, Montana said, I don't send my National Guard from Montana to uh, Fort McMurray or Edmonton. Unfortunately, they're losing their lives and their limbs uh, in places uh, in the Middle East uh, on behalf of the American uh, military uh, decisions that have been made. In terms of Venezuela, Daniel Jurgen, the respected Daniel Jurgen, who has advised many administrations, said the biggest winner of Keyst if Keystone Pipeline is not approved is Venezuela. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I, you know, in terms of energy independence, we have that choice. Energy independence in North America, energy efficiency, energy renewables, energy uh, g development of gas, development of oil. We have that vision. We can implement it. We've won the lottery. We just got to figure out a strategy to cash the ticket uh, in terms of this energy independence uh, vision. We, uh, we can choose Venezuela uh, by not approving Keystone or choose Canada. We can choose blue collar workers or hedge fund managers. And we can choose middle America, middle North America uh, versus the Middle East. So we think it just makes sense. The, the work you're doing on energy independence here today is uh, an opportunity to make the right decisions for the future and uh, decisions that we just dreamed about and talked about 40 years ago when OPEC was developing. It, it's, it's our chance now to deal with that in a very sustainable way uh, for the, our economies, uh, for our cleaner air and cleaner water and more reliability on our own energy sources. So other than that, that's my paid political announcement from the Government of Canada. Thank you very, very much. Have a great session. Thank you.